do something a little bit daring and maybe unconventional. But I want to talk about the God problem. And I know that seems counterintuitive because you think, well, if we start with the idea of God being all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, and infinite in time and all that, how could God have a problem? Um, intellectually, it's an interesting problem. I mean, it's it really is. Because Jewishness and Christianity start off with us being made in his image, which means we are like his children. And so we have an affinity for many God things. Otherwise, he'd be completely unknowable. But both Jewishness and Christianity hold that he is on some level knowable by us because we are like him in some way. And that includes our free will. And I know there's some screwy thoughts out there that are not in, in harmony with the main thought forms of Christianity and Jewishness. But basically, the way most Christians believe orthodoxy, the main central themes of Christianity and Jewishness, man's a free agent. And God respects that freedom, even though he's infinite. And so that's kind of the background for the introductory story of how we were formed and made and what happened to us and why evil's in the world. In a real fast, brush-like formula, I don't know if you've thought much about the initial Christian-Jewish story of how we came about, but the gist of it, I think, is that God was a father. And uh, he came and visited us every evening after the chores were done, as the days closed, just like a typical father would. And we had, there was there was man and woman. It was a, like a little boy and a little girl, as it were. And uh, but it's kind of strange. There was no mother, and the kids had no umbilical cord. In other words, they did not. They were not formed like regular children. They were created, but they had no mother. But they did have a father, and he was a good father. But the thing is, they weren't formed. You know how a mother spends many, many, many hours with a child close to her breast, and, and that is the child's introduction to life, is the mother. And the child gets, is really trained to trust and to love based on mom first. And then, in a sense, she introduces her child to the father, who is a more distant one. And that child learns to trust the first person after mom, which is the father. But in the initial story, there's no mother in it. In fact, there is, you could say, a friend of the family who is near at hand. And I suppose you could say it's almost like he, he molests God's children. I mean, he, he introduces some ideas to them to cause him them to distrust him. And with that deception, they decide to disobey and all of a sudden the whole world changes. The universe shifts. Um, I don't know. You may not believe the story, but I think it's interesting because <clears throat> it poses from the very beginning a problem for God because he's, he, he makes his children good. He makes the world good, and he is good. But there is a personal evil seeking to undo his happiness 
and his children's happiness together. And it's caused by a break in trust. And that break in trust is normally safeguarded in the home, at least initially by the mother. But the mother's not there. (laughs) Oh my, that's kind of, we could go off on that. But the basic problem is, okay, now we have, now something's happened. A tragedy of huge proportions has happened. How's God going to recover? If he really cares for those children, how is he going to get them back? They don't trust him anymore. They don't trust him anymore. And he didn't put a woman in there in the first place to nurture those children. He (laughs) came in the evening, every evening, and visited them and hung out with them and certainly loved them. But they were vulnerable to an outside influence because they weren't fully formed. At least that's my take on the story. So what's God going to do? Actually, all of the Christian, the Jewish and the Christian narrative is how God solves that dilemma and still leaves our free will, our dignity intact to choose. It's really a story of a courtship, as it were, between God and his lost mankind. And consistent through it, uh, I believe, is a picture of him being a father with an aching heart seeking out his children. Now, some don't see it that way. Some don't even see the, the record that way. Some point out to this and that and the other. And, and they're, they're conflicted because two people could see the same story in different ways. And let me give you an illustration um, that I think is helpful. You can have a little boy and he dearly loves his father. And they hug and they romp and they play when he comes home every day. And his, his, his son just idolizes his dad. But what the son doesn't know is that his dad in his regular occupation is a policeman. Or you could say a judge, maybe. Either, either would, illustration would do. But one day when the boy is what the father deems mature enough... He takes him with him in the squad car and uh, something happens and his father is called upon to quickly uh, arrest somebody. And with a violent masculinity and use of force, uh, he, well, maybe even shoots a man. What happens to that son? How does that son then perceive his father? Because of evil, that father's vocation is honorable. He's for the protection of the innocent. But it called, justice called upon him to intervene and to act sometimes violently. And you could say, out of character, the way the son would prefer to see his dad. The son doesn't, the little boy doesn't want to see his dad as ferocious, as as violent, as in that manner. So I believe it's all going to be all right. But you generally would prefer for your son to be older and better formed and have more before you take him. He gets to see such a thing as that. In fact, maybe you never want him to see it. I don't know. Because it's the same dad and he's still good. 
But there is another aspect to him. So anyway, think about that.